So if you argue to me in my local religious community, right, my, my local synagogue where you know, I'm Orthodox, which means that in my community, there are 300 families in our synagogue. We all know each other. We go over to each other's houses. We babysit each other's kids. If you said to us, we are going to have a, a synagogue subsidized national health care single payer program. I'd be like, okay, that's worth arguing about. Like, I'm, I'm, more, I'm, I'm definitely willing to have that conversation. I know all you people. I trust you people. I trust you're not going to be a free rider on the system and take advantage of the system because I know you. And there are social penalties for you not doing it. Mm. Right. If you, if you refuse to engage in the duties of the community, then we cannot have you over for lunch, right? We can we cannot have you at the synagogue, right? There are certain penalties that attach, mm. but you can do that at a small level. As you abstract up the chain, it becomes more and more difficult. And one of the things I see, and this this happens pretty frequently on both sides of the aisle, is an attempt to take your your top level solution and cram it all the way down mm -hmm. in a universalistic fashion. So you, so people will take sort of a, a democratic socialism that might apply in your local community, and they'll say, okay, well I want to apply that at the national level, but that's not you you can't do that, and or you'll say. I mean, you have to do that when it comes to healthcare. Like, that's the only way to actually universalize the system and make it so that way there's better outcomes. Like, you don't want to have, like, this patchwork of different healthcare across the states with varying prices, varying networks, because if you have that, then that leads to a fucked up system that we have, right? So you don't want that. You want everything to be standard. You want federal standards. You want one, uh, one plan, one insurance company, for everyone, and that company should be the government. Libertarians will do the same thing. You know, I'm a libertarian. I think there should be no internal penalties for any individual decision that you want to make. That's not going to work in your family, and it's not going to work in your local community. In other words, the, the levels of control— Okay, he, he, he's like trying to pretend as if a society is comparable to a family, when that's a false equivalence. Like, you exist simultaneously in both. So you can't just say, well, yeah, I'm communist in my family, but I don't want to be communist in society. There's no economic system in your family in the same way that there's an economic system in government, in society, right? I institutionally speaking. So I, I hate this type of like this type of argumentation where conservatives will try to bring you to their side by using a close to home argument like another example is i would i would get into you know arguments with conservatives in my family over immigration and they'd say oh well if you support immigration uh well then why don't you just leave your front door unlocked and i'm like what what does that even mean they're like see because it's like just leaving the border open so you wouldn't leave your front door unlocked so we should close the border as well gotcha and it's like, mother f we have a closed border. Like, because people get over doesn't mean that we don't have a border. And, um, like, I just, when, when I hear something like that, they're just trying to avoid saying we need to be very harsh to immigrants and break the Constitution and not allow them to even seek asylum. Like, that's all that I hear because they're trying to find a very nice way of saying that f***ed up thing. Maybe it's to make them feel better. Maybe it's to make us feel better. But either way, it's still f***ed up. And the substance is the same. So that's what I, you know, that's what I get from Ben Shapiro's argument here. And it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. That you exercise ought to change based on the level of abstraction that, that we're talking about. I think that part of the problem is we don't see each other as fellow Americans at all. And we're so True. divided that, you know, I think you make a valid point in, you know, at least some portion of the country wanting to reject some of these national policies or national programs. They don't see someone living in here. You know what? I'll put it in, in the context of the left and, and honestly what my own biases were and, uh, what I used to see the middle of America as and how I've kind of grown away from that. Um, this is kind of embarrassing to admit, but I'm obsessed with that show Yellowstone specifically because it's a good show. it kind of destroyed oh, my no. preconceived notions no. about a huge... I'm thinking of Yellow Jackets. I have not seen Yellowstone, so I don't want to endorse a show that I have not seen. So Yellow Jackets is good. Yellowstone, I can't speak to that. Which part of this country, right? So the show, I think does a good job in tearing down stereotypes about people in Wyoming, definitely, but ranchers, conservatives, all of that. You watch that show and you start remembering, oh, wait, yeah, they're Americans. They're like us. They have maybe a different lifestyle, but at the end of the day, they want the exact same things. I think what's important is to, like, again, bring the temperature down for a second and give Americans accurate information about what the policies would really do and then allow them to vote on that, 
on their own, right? Instead of trying to sway them in one direction or another, Americans know that healthcare is broken in this country. I think that, you know, there's a lot of, on both sides, certainly. I mean, you, corporate Democrats and corporate media like MSNBC, they hate Medicare for all. I mean, they've been tearing it down from the beginning. Same with CNN. The, the question that we heard over and over again when Bernie Sanders was running and promoting Medicare for all was, how are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it? Okay, great. They don't ask the same question when it comes to shelling out tens of billions of dollars for a war effort in Ukraine. Like, exactly. There is no debate about it. Now, look, I, I happen to think it's important to help Ukraine defend itself because we made security commitments after and Ukraine. And not just like military industrial complex spending. They never ask questions when it comes to tax cuts for the rich, maybe a little bit with the Trump tax scam because they hated Donald Trump. But they also don't ask how we pay for fossil fuel subsidies like there's this bias whenever it's spending that benefits the American people. The question of, of how are we going to pay for it always comes up, but never when it comes to like spending on war. Like if we're if we're blowing people up, if we're spending money like bombing people in the middle, middle East and North Africa, that's fine. But don't ask me how we're going to get clean drinking water to uh, to Flint. Don't ask me how we're going to feed these uh, starving children. Don't ask me how we're going to house the unhoused. It's just it, it's such a bullshit double standard that shows you how corporatized our media is. Like they are just status quo defenders, as subservient to government as state media would be. Gave up its nuclear weapons. We were part of those negotiations. I think it's important to keep our promises. But with that said, it is interesting how the corporate media puts its thumb on the scale. They pretend like, oh my God, this is the most costly thing in the world. How are we going to pay for it? But when it comes to other issues, like issues that would enrich defense contractors, there is no conversation about how we're going to pay for it. That's a problem. I mean, I totally agree that we should always have the conversation about how we're going to pay for it. And I also agree that that what is happening in Ukraine it may be an unpopular position on some parts of the right, but I've been an advocate of funding Ukraine. It seems like the, the single best defense investment that the United States has made in the recent past it, it, for a relatively cheap cost. We've absolutely crippled the Russian military, which is something I think is probably uh, a good thing, globally speaking. W with that said, th there obviously is a difference in scale between the amount of money that we're spending in Ukraine and the amount of money that would take right. to do Medicare for all. Right. And, and th there are obviously significant drawbacks to Medicare. For, I mean, if you look at the NHS, for example, there's a recent article in the New York Times talking about the delays in, for example, ambulances, people waiting 12, 24 hours. Mm -hmm. See, they always bring this up. It's the oldest talking point in the book. For elective procedures, sure, you're going to have a wait time. But studies have shown consistently that the wait times are the same, if not better, in countries where they have a universal healthcare system where it's free at the point of service. And when it comes to spending, like people like to make it seem as if Medicare for all is incredibly spendy. And it is. What they're not telling you is that, yes, federal spending will increase by a lot. But currently, the way that healthcare is funded is by states, right? So the way that would work is federal spending would go up while state and local spending on healthcare goes down, right? So even if you're spending more federally, you're saving money at the state and local level. And when you universalize that system, you make it more efficient. There's less administrative costs. You have one payer. That's why it works so well in other countries. So this whole fear mongering about how expensive it is, like if poorer countries have been able to afford it, then I think that a country with its own fiat currency, where money is literally just fake, we made it up, taxes don't even fund spending, if you look at it, technically speaking, uh, I think we, we can we can afford Medicare for all. We can figure out how to, how to fund it. But the reason why we don't is because we live in a late-stage capitalist society where the goal isn't to deliver health care. The goal is to make sure that insurance companies are able to make profits and those profits in turn go into the pockets of politicians either through stock investments or campaign contributions and that's why things haven't changed because our system runs on money our government runs on money and it's sickening so i, I talk about this study all the time but the 2014 princeton university study by doctors gillens and page they found that we functionally live in an oligarchy what that means is based on their research 
whatever businesses and corporations and elites want, that gets passed. But just normal working class Americans, we have a statistically insignificant impact on policy outcomes, meaning what we want never becomes law. That is the product of capitalism hollowing out our democracy because capitalism is like a virus, right? It, it seeks to commodify every single element of our society. And once all the businesses have become commodified, you know, where you take healthcare and things that were previously public services, education, and you turn those into businesses, what left is there for capitalism to go after than democracy? And that's what we've seen little by little with Buckley v. Vallejo in the 70s, Citizens United. So like this is all not like some sort of defect of capitalism. It is a feature, an expectation of capitalist systems. And it's not just in the United States. It's happening elsewhere as well. But the difference is that in other countries, like and when I say states, I mean countries, by the way. Um, but in other countries, they're at least savvy enough to know that you have to give the peasants more than crumbs. Otherwise, they start to question the legitimacy of that system. At least give them health care so that way they don't die so we can have a healthy working class who can be exploited by these capitalist laborers, uh, overlords. Um, but our system is like the worst of the worst when it comes to capitalist hellscapes. On a field, not being able to get what they need because once you make systems national, you're going to have to in some way ration the resources. And then the question becomes, what are the resources? Either you have to increase- But we already have rationing. We ration not based on need. We ration currently based on income. Healthcare is given to those who can afford it. And if you can't afford it, then you either don't have healthcare or you have to go to the emergency room. That's your healthcare, that's your doctor. And that's spendy too. And even if you have health insurance, well, you're still going to have to pay copays. There's deductibles or, God forbid, you get taken by an ambul ambulance and you go to a hospital that's out of your network. It's as if you didn't even pay for insurance in the first place. So we already ration. What he's saying is an old scare tactic to get people to believe that the shitty system that fucks them over and makes them pay thousands every single year for shitty insurance is actually preferable to a system that just makes sense like Canada's resources that you're utilizing, which means increasing taxes or increasing regulations, right. or you have to regulate the amount of care that people can receive on the other end. Well, my, my personal experience with, with sort of a Medicare for all system is in Israel, their emergency care is very good. And if you have cancer, you are in serious trouble. That, 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 and this happens to be what the statistics kind of bear out. The United States has the highest five-year survival rate for things like breast cancer. Kind of bear out. Okay, look at the overall picture. Look at health outcomes overall. And consistently, other countries with Universal healthcare systems, either uh, similar to the NHS or uh, single payer, like in Canada, they have better health outcomes than us and they spend less. So, what he's saying here is he's trying to find specific examples uh, within the realm of healthcare where the US might excel. And he's trying to make it, make it seem as if that's representative of the bigger picture. When in actuality, if you zoom out, you'll see mm, actually these other countries with universal healthcare. They fare far better than us. And again, this is key. They spend less. There's no argument against it. You have a serious disease. People are coming to the United States for surgery, for treatment. If you have a broken arm, you're probably better off in a nationalized healthcare system. Right. People come to the United States because we ration care based on income. So if you're a really rich person in Canada or Israel or the UK, sure, you can come to the United States and get quicker care and probably really good care because you can get in if you have money because, again, we ration based on income and money, not on need, which is the way that a logical healthcare system would ration. Because it's a fairly simple thing to, to solve and it's not going to cost you, quote right. unquote, anything except indirectly. But, but I think it's really important to differentiate the quality of care that is available in the United States, which I agree with you is fantastic if you can afford it. And exactly. when it comes to your life or when it comes to a family member's life, let's say you don't have the money up front to, to pay for the procedures or the treatment that you need, right? People are willing to go into debt because at the end of the day, it's about your life. And yeah. I am tired of seeing elderly individuals, retired individuals in this country lose everything, go bankrupt because of how broken our healthcare system is. It and I really hope she brings up the fact that a Princeton study uh, that came out in 2019, pre-pandemic, so the numbers are probably different now, um, they estimated that 68,000 people die because we have a shitty healthcare system, because they have a lack of health insurance. 
And that number is a pretty conservative estimate because they didn't take into account people who are underinsured. So they have insurance, but it's it's insurance that is trash or they couldn't afford the de uh, deductible. Um, so yeah, excellent point by Anna here. Needs to be fixed. So on one hand, I agree with you. The quality of care is certainly here. It's, it's where people come to to get the treatment they need. But in a lot of cases, Americans go bankrupt for this. I'll give you an example. My mom was uh, diagnosed with, uh, she'll be okay with me sharing this uh, because I've talked about it on the show before. She was uh, diagnosed with blood cancer uh, last year. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, and it was, it was really difficult because her bone marrow stopped producing hemoglobin and we didn't know what was wrong with her before she got diagnosed. She was just very, very weak. She had no color at all. It was terrifying. She had to keep going in to get blood transfusions. Finally, they diagnosed her and they said, look, the good news is there is a medication. You can be on this medication for the rest of your life. It's a chemotherapy medication. It's called Revlimid, mm. but it's monopolized. And even though Revlimid was discovered decades ago, and I think the 1950s, if I'm not mistaken, the way patent law works with pharmaceutical drugs, I mean, they found loopholes and they were able to extend the patent, extend it. So there's only one option. And even with insurance, I mean, my mom's older, you know, she's she's covered and everything. Even with insurance, it's $2,500 out of pocket. And, you know, I'll do anything to keep my mom alive. You know, we're, we'll contribute to it. Luckily, you know, they found a solution. She's doing great. But if you don't have the privileges that my family has, if you don't have family members who are making enough money to contribute to help pay for that medication, you are screwed. You're either going to go bankrupt or you're just going to decide I'm not going to get the medication. And I'm just... And I, I'm so glad that she's bringing up this anecdote. Uh, it's so sad to hear about that. Like, I'm glad that um, she got the medication. But yeah, this is this is something that a lot of families experience. Ben Shapiro can't like look her in the in the eyes and deny her lived experience, deny this horrible situation. Right. So that's why you always got to bring it back to these personal stories, because even though the micro isn't always indicative like of what the macro is going to look like. In this instance, like our healthcare system is so shitty that like everyone has these types of stories, right? Like I talked about how after my my dad died in 2020 for months, my mom got uh, these bills for tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and since our healthcare system is so confusing, he had insurance. He was a veteran, but was also on Medicare. And so it's like she didn't know. Do I have to pay for this? Am I on the hook? for this bill for $60,000 that I just got. Like, it's overly complicated. It's a pain in the ass. You have to re-up. Uh, you pay monthly payments. Like, there's just, there's no good argument for keeping this f***ed up system. And the only way that you get Americans to consent to keep this system is by either um, lying to them or duping them into thinking that the uh, ulterior uh, alternative would be worse, which is what politicians have resorted to doing. I'm going to end my life that way. Right. And but, I, I don't want Americans suffering from that. So we need to find a better solution. And so far from what I've noticed in different models in other countries, that single payer solution seems to be the best option. Right. So I, I would obviously argue. So that that's probably where Anna and I probably disagree a little bit. I, I think that single payer is great. And I would take that in a heartbeat if we had the opportunity. But like if we're really starting from scratch, I want a national healthcare system like the UK. Now, their system is not perfect as well, but the difference is is important here. So a single payer system just means that the government is your insurance provider. But a national health system like the UK not only means that like the government is your insurance provider and healthcare is free at the point of service, but hospitals are actually um, owned by the government as well. Now, there's some private hospitals in the UK, but for the most part, hospitals, doctors, nurses, these are government workers. And the reason why that's also really important is because we have to decommodify all healthcare, decommodify uh, hospitals. And if you do that, that changes things because hospitals are no longer operating as a business. They're not trying to increase profits and nickel and dime patients. They're trying to produce good health outcomes, right? Because the state would benefit by citizens being healthy, being uh, able to work. 
And so that's what you get in the UK. Now, it's not perfect, like the Tories have been going out of their way to undermine the national health system. Even in Canada, Doug Ford is trying to fuck up their health system and Americanize it because, again, there's a profit motive there. Um, it's like, and conservatives might use those examples of conservatives in other countries. Conservatives in the US are trying to use this example of conservatives in other countries trying to Americanize their healthcare systems as evidence that their way of doing things doesn't work and our way of doing things is preferable. But the reality is that these are also capitalist countries, right? So just like we have health insurance companies here, you have health vultures, you have lobbyists in other countries who are trying to chip away and neoliberalize these healthcare systems, carve out exceptions to care so that way the possibility of insurance can pop up, right? Break the system, propose fixes with the fixes being privatization. Like this is what they do. It's their method. It's what they've been doing here with regard to Social Security. So we've heard how Social Security is going bankrupt in, in 10 years. Yeah, well, um, in 2024, it's going to go insolvent in 2037. In 2025, then it'll go insolvent in 2038. Like it keeps rolling over, but they want to make it seem as if it's broken so they can propose a fix. And that fix really is reforms that undermine it, privatization. Like it's it's a go-to trick for these neoliberal ghouls who want to turn public services into private profit money-making uh, ventures, which is sickening to me. Have to take into account a few different things in a situation like that. One yeah. is the cost of development of, of drugs. Virtually all medical patents happen in the United States, specifically because it is a free market system. We fund the research and development, though. Uh, well, I mean, we do, but it's not even close to what the, the actual medical companies spend on research and development. What the federal government spends on R&D for medical product is so much lower than what Pfizer spends on R&D. And, and it takes forever for, I mean, the vast majority of these things are washouts. Hundreds of billions of dollars will be spent on drugs. For pharmaceutical that, companies? By pharmaceutical companies that don't go to phase three. I mean, they certainly provide quite a bit to their shareholders. So. Well, I mean, it depends on which ones. You, you're yeah. looking at the ones that yeah. actually succeed. I mean, they're, they're, for, for every pharmaceutical company that succeeds and actually becomes a thing, there are a dozen that fail. I mean, this is, this is just the way that pharmace biopharmaceuticals work. I was talking with my friend Vivek Ramaswamy, who founded Royvent Sciences, and this is literally how he used to invest. The idea was that you invest in a bevy of drugs. By the way, I just have to point out, I'm not watching this at 1.5 speed. This is just the speed that Ben Shapiro talks at, so I didn't change anything. <laughs> He's... <laughs> motor mouth ask it mm -hmm. and the vast majority of them will die before phase three and a few of them will be successful how do you make up all the money to pay for all the ones that fail in order to pay for the one that succeeds so how do you continue to incentivize it so i think that the the, the questions that we ask right. are the same questions the solutions are different so how right. do we continue to incentivize the creation of drugs that can help your mom Two, how do we help your mom pay for the drugs once she gets sick without destroying the incentive Three, how do we actually incentivize doctors to care for your mom with, say, Medicare reimbursement rates that aren't significantly lower than what they can get cash out of pocket, which very often you're seeing doctors in specialized fields just stop taking Medicare entirely because mm. they're operating now across the table. They'll just say, we'll take cash only. This happens in the surgical profession a lot, a lot. Right. And so the, the, there are, I think, systems that are in between what we have and single-payer healthcare that have been significantly more efficient in this respect. Switzerland is one of them. Singapore is another one of them. My argument isn't with restructuring the system. It's how we restructure the system. And, mm. I, and the, the, so simplic the simplicity of the NHS comes with significant downstream effect. Right. Which is... So, like, the, what, is, the one other thing what does he want? Like, you want something between what we have and what other countries have? So, like, a public option? Because... Conservatives will also denounce that as socialism. And look, I'm, I'm desperate. I'll take a public option. But a public option also is not the end all be all because that's a multi payer system. And what you're going to see happen is that will be underfunded and overburdened because private insurance companies will push sick people off onto that system. And then conservatives will use that as evidence that socialized medicine doesn't work. It'll undermine the fight for Medicare for all, a single payer system, and we're back to square one again. So I don't, I don't like. For me, I would take a public option and be happy with that if that's all that we could get. But we can do better, and we should do better. I mean, you need all Americans in a single risk pool, right? Because that's how you keep costs lower. And also, we've got to focus on, like, preventative care as well. Like, that's one thing that people don't talk about. Like, we, we, we discuss risks um, 
and risk pools, but not like how to prevent people from getting sicker and needing healthcare in the first place. But that's a different story for a different day. Say is, okay, so just quickly on the pharmaceutical yeah. drugs. I mean, you will admit though, right, that when you look at the amount of money Americans are charged for pharmaceutical drugs relative to any other country, we're being price gouged. Well, we're, 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 we are subsidizing the rest of the world in their price gouging is, is how I put it. I mean, the, the reason I say that is because we are paying free market prices and they are paying cartel, cartelizes. The, they've cartelized their price, their pricing structure. And so we could. Okay, but what does that matter? Like you agree that we're paying way too much. Like just, you agree, right? radically bargain negotiate with the with drug companies and then all the patents will get filed elsewhere that's well, that, I mean, that is the other downside in the Someone very in the very least i mean one of the proposed policy solutions in build back better that was nixed was allowing for medicare to negotiate drug prices on behalf of medicare recipients Right. That was squashed. I mean, not entirely. I think there's like a handful of drugs. That no, it's, it's, and, it's for, and it's for this reason. It's right. because the, the great fear in terms of the incentive structure was if you allow Medicare, which supports a huge percentage of people who are taking these drugs, to negotiate the price, what you're going to do is remove essentially the R&D budgets of a lot of these, of these companies. Okay, this is a straight up talking point from these pharmaceutical companies. Unironically, this motherfucker is a pharma shill. What he's saying here is bullshit like he's actually arguing that medicare should not be allowed to negotiate drugs because he buys the line from the pharmaceutical companies whose motive is profits not healing people that oh well you see if 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 you negotiate prices then r d goes down and we're gonna have to charge you more I don't know, there's some, like i'm sorry but this is all fucking bullshit if they don't want to allow medicare negotiate or if they don't want to negotiate with medicare how about we nationalize these fuckers? every single american drug company we nationalize them and now you're not worried about profits you're not worried about shareholders r d the government will take care of it why don't we just do that dissolve the board nationalize these pricks he thinks that this is like a valid argument. Not buying that. Well, I mean, at the, all. The, the, the truth <laughs> is, the profit margins in these companies. I mean, take take for example, Moderna. Moderna had to sink tens of billions of dollars into the development of RNA vaccines, and it was a complete failure until COVID. I mean, the, like that was a the, Moderna was essentially bankrupt before before COVID happened, and this is unfortunately the way that that science very often works: that it fails and fails and fails and fails until it succeeds, and it costs and costs and costs until it succeeds. And th this is, I think, a general point about business that people should understand as a person who is a business person who runs a successful business. For every business that gets founded, succeeds, and people see the really rich person at the very top, they miss the five businesses that they started before that failed. Mm. And literally, for me and my business partner, it was several businesses that we had started before that did not succeed until we hit the one that actually worked. They also miss the uh, funding from right-wing billionaires as well, which, uh, you know, a lot of normal Americans don't have access to. And they don't see the other businesses that started and failed. Most industries are more like the restaurant business mm. than they are like any other. Well, I mean, look, you're going to start a business and you take a risk. And if you succeed, you succeed. If you fail, you fail. Uh, but at the end of the day, when we're talking about Americans funding research and development for these pharmaceutical drugs, I don't think it makes sense for us to then be price gouged by these companies, which... Look, I mean, look, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I wish look, I did. It's as simple as that. To even discuss the pharmaceutical industry and healthcare within the context of businesses is so f***ed up. Like, we've already lost if we're talking about it in that context. Like, I'm not talking about, like, the framing here. Anna's, Anna's doing a wonderful job. I'm just saying, like, in general, the way that we conceptualize pharmaceutical companies is not the public good that they provide. It's, well, you know, they... There's there's costs associated with R and D. We are funding them, mother. Okay, and they're making that back tenfold. They're gouging American citizens. And Ben Shapiro, with a straight face, is saying, "Well, you know, maybe the profits aren't that great, and they really spend a lot of money." I can't. He is insufferable. But you look at the profits from these pharmaceutical companies. The amount of money they make profit alone every year, year after year, the amount of money they pay their executives year after year. I don't think you can make the case that the amount that they charge Americans for these drugs makes much sense. I mean, obviously, we'll have to we'll have to disagree on that one. Yeah. It's fun, but we're getting to disagree. On you that. have to yeah. disagree on that one. Thirty eight million shareholder return. Twenty eight point seven percent. Thirty two million shareholder return. Negative twenty one percent. But all the all these other ones. Positive shareholder return, three hundred eighty-six percent. Eighteen million salary for their uh, for their CEO. Look at millions, million, million, like fifteen million, ten million. 
all positive shareholder return, 8 million, uh, 7 million. We're talking about salaries where these pharmaceutical CEOs have <laughs> you money. They can buy anything in their wildest dreams. A mansion, another mansion, another mansion, a yacht, a Lamborghini. Like, they're going to have so much money. And by the time they leave that company, like, they'll have even more money that they would never be able to spend all of that money if they lived to be a thousand years old. And Ben Shapiro with the straight face is saying, well, there's a lot of costs associated with, you know, research and development, and they put in a lot of money. So, uh, you know, they're not doing as good as you think they are. Yes, they are, Ben. They are. Okay. God, this is like... For, does anyone remember that meme, First World Problems? It's like the First World Problem meme of the business world. And he's like just saying their talking points for them. Like, I, I hope that he's getting paid for using their talking points. I hope that they at least take him out for dinner because of how hard he's riding their dick. Because to do all of this for free is honestly embarrassing.